everybody for coming today to the kickoff brown bag for Archaeology and Preservation Month 2017. Uh, I'm Chris Merritt. I'm an archaeologist here at the Utah Division of State History. And this month is the national celebration of historic preservation. And in Utah, we include the archaeology and historic preservation aspect. This week, we have Dr. Ken Cannon from Cannon Heritage Consultants up at Logan. And he's going to be talking about his research on the Bear River Massacre and the geoarchaeology he's been working on for a few years now. I'd like to thank um, Brad and Chris and the staff of State History for, for the invitation um, they provided me to talk here today. Um, and also to all of you for showing up. It's a beautiful day outside. And appreciate you giving up a nice sunny walk outside to sit in here and listen to me. Um, and it's also. Um, exciting to provide the kickoff talk for Utah Archaeology and Preservation Month. And um, just to give a little bit of a shout out, um, Molly Cannon is the director of the Museum of Anthropology up in Logan, and they're going to have uh, their first Saturdays is going to feature archaeology and cool, art, cool technologies. So if anybody's up in Logan on Saturday, stop in at the museum. Okay. So on January 29, 1863, as the Civil War entered its third and decisive year, the Shoshone Winter Village, Baya Oji, or Big Water, <clears throat> was destroyed by five companies of California volunteers under the command of Colonel Patrick Connor. Three months earlier, Connor had been charged with securing the western sections of the Overland Mail, Telegraph, and Emigrant routes, linking the Union's eastern and, and with its west, remote western states and territories. After a seven-day march from Camp Douglas at Salt Lake City, cavalry and infantry initiated a dawn assault on the Shoshone village. Although the Shoshone, the Shoshone position was stoutly defended, the initial battle quickly turned into a rout and a massacre. In the four hours of fighting, 25 soldiers were killed or mortally wounded, and another 49 wounded severely enough to require surgical attention and hospitalization. Frostbite hospitalized almost as many soldiers by the time they, reached, they returned to Camp Douglas. For the Shoshone, the outcome was much more devastating. The count of casualties varies with reporters and their closeness to the event. but was probably not less than 250 dead, with hundreds of survivors left wounded, homeless, and unattended. In 2013, the Idaho Historical Society received a grant from the American Battlefield protection program to develop a more detailed map of the Bear River Massacre n n historic landmark. <clears throat> At the time, uh, USU Archaeological Services, in collaboration with Molly Cannon, director of USU's Museum of Anthropology and the Spatial Data Collection Analysis Visualization Lab, was awarded the subcontract to conduct the field investigations. Dr. Joel Pedersen of USU's geology department was also engaged to conduct the geomorphic studies. Dr. Ken Reed, um, state archaeologist in, in Idaho, was, uh, was, the, was the PI on the project as well. Like most contemporary archaeological investigations, this project involved an interdisciplinary team who brought their various talents and, and expertise to the problem. Our methods include detailed mapping of landforms and excavations conducted with an RTK, which is essentially um, a mapping system that's, that's directly connected to satellites, so it's a, it's a really high precision GPS unit. Um, metal detection and excavation of metal hits for identification. Um, and geophysical surveys, which included a magnet, magnetic radiometer survey and ground penetrating radar. Uh, and also our geomorphic investigations. Historical archaeology in comparison to pre-contact archaeology has the added dimension of historical do historic documents, written accounts, and oral histories that provide another set of data to be considered. Therefore, a major aspect of this project has been assessing the various historic records and maps and applying them to the on-the-ground uh, investigations and studies. Um, these, uh, this will be the topic of this presentation. <clears throat> And like um, most, uh, most endeavors, um, we have a number of uh, supporters, uh, both um, institutionally and as well as providing funding. Um, but obviously, um, our work would not, would not have proceeded without the support of the members of the Northwest Spanish Shoshone. 
Their confidence and trust in our efforts is greatly appreciated. Specifically, I would like to thank Darren Perry and Patty Timbimbu Madsen for their guidance and friendship. Um, and financial support was mainly from the National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program, but we also got financial support from the Idaho Heritage Trust, the Idaho State Historical Society, uh, and the Museum of Anthropology at Utah State University also provided institutional support. So the specific goals of our project were locating the, the Shoshone Winter Village, where was the core area of the combat, what are the boundaries of the study area and what impacts have affected it since 1863? And what evidence is there for earlier occupations within the landmark? And, and kind of to, to emphasize is that the work that we were doing was mostly to identify the boundaries to the landmark. It was mostly a mapping program project. <clears throat> and our work was never intended for the reinterpretation of the battle and massacre. So this is just kind of a map, um, kind of looking from um, where are we from the north? Northwest looking to the southeast um, down the ravine area here where we think the Shoshone village is um, and across the, the river there. So that just gives you a little bit of a orientation of the landscape out there. The Bear River Massacre site is located within the northern portion of Cache Valley in southeast Idaho. Cache Valley is a traditional territory of the northwest band of, of Shoshone. The Shoshone and ancestral Native Americans occupied the verdant Cache Valley for thousands of years, practicing a highly mobile lifestyle that seasonally moved throughout the Intermountain and Great Basin region of the present-day states of Idaho, Nevada, and Utah. In the mid-19th century, the Eastern Shoshone were led by Chief Washaki. Two major bands, the Fort Hall Shoshone under Chief Pocatello and the Northwest Band of Shoshone under Chief Sagwich and Bear Hunter lived in this area. Each of the bands consisted between 300 and 400 people. Uh, over the course of the past 154 years, numerous natural and anthropomorphic effects, uh, impacts have been, have been incurred on the, within the landmark uh, boundary. So the Union and Northern uh, railroad uh, existed there from 1877 to 1890, um, and there was actually even a town called Battle Creek that existed probably in this area right there. Um, the West Cache Canal construction between 1898 and 1904, which probably which also produced um, human remains during their excavations that have since been, been repatriated to the Northwest Band of Shoshone. Um, a great flood of 1911, that washed away the earthen aqueduct. The sediment was redeposited in the lower ravine and filled a swampy depression in the East Plain that became the Will Carter Farm. So that probably occurred in this, this area over, over here. Um, we also have county and state road systems and an ongoing agriculture. The valley also, um, the valley also has an active landslide complex along both the Bear River and Battle Creek that has added to the complexity of these investigations. And this just shows you a map of uh, Winder Reservoir, which probably broke and, and caused this major flooding down here in 1911. <clears throat> a number of historic documents were used in the development of landscape models and, and directing our investigations. Of crucial importance was a series of maps produced by bat military combatants or based upon first-hand accounts. The first of these maps was drawn by Cavalry Sergeant William Beach from his hospital bed 16 days after the attack as he recovered from frostbite. This map or manuscript, as it's been described, has an interesting pedigree. It was originally found in a private collection and traded to historian Harold Schindler. And I think um, uh, Brigham Madsen was involved in, in uh, precipitating that, that transaction. Um, the map and the narrative were published in 1999 in Utah Historical Quarterly by Schindler. Uh, it was written in link on, an art, on a large sheet of paper and folded into four pages. Um, the map is on the fourth page. Details of the Battle of Massacre are described, including a count of 280 Shoshone deaths. In an addendum by historian Ephraim Dixon, who was um, recently at, at Fort Douglas, he sadly notes that the map is no longer in the Schindler family collections and has likely been lost. So if anybody knows where that map is, please let us know, because uh, it's a very important resource, obviously. The Sergeant Beach map um, provides a depth and width of the ravine, but not necessarily its, its length. Um, so this has been, been redrafted by the, um, 
Idaho Historical Society folks to make it a little bit clearer. Uh, and it shows the Shoshone village along the, the length of the ravine. Um, and the focus is on the location of the military units before the attack. And the temporal code for it is present tense and probably over a two hour duration period. Um, so this would be um, the ravine coming down uh, and the mouth of, uh, of Battle Creek or, um, or at the time it was known as Beaver Creek and <clears throat> the Bear River. This, this island here known as Willow Island is also an important aspect of the, um, the events of January 29th. The second map has been attributed to James Henry Martineau, an accomplished topographic engineer in the Mormon militia, who by the time of the attack was well acquainted with northern Cache Valley. Uh, he had previously done a map, a uh, plat map of, of Logan and some of the uh, surrounding environments, so he was, he was well acquainted with the area. However, because because the map's annotation so closely follows sequent events given by a newspaper correspondent writing within days of the attack, who mentions his own use of Captain Price's diagram, we suspect the sketch was actually drafted by Captain George Price, commander of Company M, 2nd Cavalry, one of the unwounded officers present throughout the action. Uh, but we cannot rule out a collaborative effort on this map, and Price may have, may have worked with Martineau to annotate the sketch shortly after the attack. While the Verso comments listing the Shoshone casualties appear to be in Martineau's hand, the map in no way resembles his style of cartography. Um, so the Price map is obviously a, much more of a cartoon than, than the more precise maps that, that Martineau was, was, um, was um, used to making and producing. But there was obviously some collaboration between the two, which is an interesting part of the story as well. Um, so the, the Martinum map, and again, this is, um, this is redrafted by the um, Idaho Historical Society folks. Um, it gives a length um, of about three quarters of a mile, but not the width or depth of the ravine. Uh, does not show the location of the Shoshone village. Um, the Shoshone defensive position is about 1,600 feet long, beginning about 800 feet above the confluence. Um, and the temporal code is in a past tense, and it has a, a duration of probably about 24 hours. So again, it's real, it's, it shows a similar bend in the river. This, um, this Willow Island is there, and, and also the, the ravine. So uh, both the price map and the um, beach map are, are similar in, in a fair number of aspects. <clears throat> Other historic documents such as the General Land Office Survey from 1872 and a 1915 U.S. Geological Survey topographic map were also used in developing models of landscape change. This map provides a view of the various courses of the Bear River and Battle Creek over the past 150 years that we derive from these other, these other sources. Um, this, was this was drawn up by, by Joel Pat Pedersen and um, one of his students. Um, the, as you can see here, this, these stars here actually signify where we, we think the, the mouth of Battle Creek might have been along these various courses. Um, a major issue we were trying to address was the large distance Battle Creek travels before entering the Bear River, as seen on modern maps, and the relatively short distance depicted in the historic maps. So here's um, Battle Creek today is coming out of here out of the ravine. Um, and it's this really large distance that's, that's represented here. And, and all the historic um, maps and the and narratives suggest that it was a much shorter period um, distance between uh, the ravine where the village was and the mouth of, the, of, the, um, of, of Battle Creek into the Bear River. And this was actually an escape route for a lot of the, the Shoshone trying to um, get away from the battle. Um, so this was, this, this was really um, kind of a a puzzling component to the, land, to the landscape that we see today and what was being depicted in the historic 1863 documents. Um, one of the things that is important to understand is that the Bear River flows through unconsolidated fine sediments and has been subject to numerous course changes in its history. And you can see a whole number of, of different meander scars here all over the place that, that kind of attest to that, that really active landform out there. Um, so this knowledge, plus our understanding of the cool, wet climate regime, provides for a fairly complex history of the dynamics of the river. And what I wanted to show here is that um, we had this really wet pluvial period based on uh, dendrochronology in the Bear River that um, 
that probably would have had uh, a significant influence on, on the Bear River and its, and its tributaries during this later part of the um, 1860s. So for us, identifying the confluence of Battle Creek and the Bear River was always paramount because it was the site of the, of the Shoshone Winter Village. At the start of our research, we had three hypothetical pathways of the early historic Battle Creek Channel. Uh, a western path, which we kind of came down, down through here, and the mouth was down, down in this area, <clears throat> and, a route, and then a second route um, that follows. So these are all the present channels of uh, course of the, of the Battle Creek or Beaver Creek up in this area. And then it gets channelized and gets into this irrigation ditch here. So we thought that possibly um, it was, the mouth was over in this area here. And then a third possibility that was, it would follow the, the current course that we can see and somehow crossed over into this eastern area and, and uh, had its mouth somewhere in here on the Bear River. And what we were looking at was actually the, you know, the configuration of the river today based on those, those two historic maps which show this big bend here, um, kind of a, an east-west bend, and it's similar over here. So those are the, the contemporary landmarks that we're using today to try and build our, <clears throat> our models, which um, Joel Pedersen was going to do the groundwork on to test these, these models. Um, and then the third considered map was drafted in 1926 by a professional land surveyor named W.T. Aiken. Initially, we did not give the, the map appropriate credibility due to its temporal distance from the event and the secondhand nature of the narrative. But after initial field reconnaissance of the landscape and other factors coming to light, the map became more important to us. The map appears to have been commissioned by the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers and does in fact show a proposed monument, although not in its eventual 1932 spot. Um, so I think they have the monuments over, over in here up on, the, on that ridge line there. <clears throat> um, it was first published in the back pocket of Newell Hart's self-published 1982 monograph. Um, Despite the florid phrasing of inset texts and invented quotes comparing the site to Thermopylae, the Custer Battlefield, and the Alamo, the map stands as a gem of historical geography. The source of the information from the map seems to have, have been James Packer, this James Packer Jr., the son of one of the Mormon teamsters who had conveyed the wounded soldiers back to Franklin the morning after the battle. <clears throat> However, we are still researching the map and have since found two other versions of the same map. Uh, and they're up at the, in the archives in, in Boise at the Idaho State Historical Society. When we superimpose the map over a Google Earth aerial photo, it comes fairly close to remnant landforms associated with the Bear River. I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's that easily seen, but there's, there's an old meander scars here um, that kind of align up nicely with with uh, his map, and also we have his, his section lines there too. Um, other maps that were also used when reconstructing the landscape were the 1872 GLO and 1915 map um, that also um, I talked about previously. Uh, this map is intriguing and also matches Joel Pedersen's Terra sequence, which was um, completed independently. The geomorphic study by Joel Pedersen and his student Kelsey Wetzel and the dating of Varick's exposures provides an independent story for, of the valley. Um, so what we were doing was trying to find exposed um, cutbacks and collecting charcoal out of, out of old, uh, um, these are old soil horizons here. This is Joel Pedersen collecting samples here, getting radiocarbon dates on those. And then we also found this remnant hearth um, in the, just in the ravine area. This is a ravine area, but then downslope from the ravine area that dated to about 8,900 8, years ago. So these radiocarbon dates helped us um, to put some controls on the landforms out there. So the radio dating uh, provided chronometric control for the three inset terra sequences that we saw that uh, Joel has mapped. The T1, which is, a, is, a, um, is shown up here, that's the first terrace, um, is probably less than 300 years old. It's a small uh, remnant in that middle ravine area, um, and it, but it also shows up in, uh, in other, as, other areas as well. Uh, but this was the main, main focus of our investigations. And we also think that it may be um, the probable uh, site of the, of the Winter Village and uh, also where most of the, uh, the fighting, the more intense hand-to-hand -hand combat probably occurred in that area. 
Um, the second terrace has three radiocarbon dates um, that go from 330 years ago to 2130 years ago, um, with that um, hearth also dating to 900 years ago. So again, we have these, this, these series of, of radiocarbon dates that we can use in, in controlling our, our landscapes and helping our, with our investigations. And then the T3, which is the highest of the landforms out there, we, we did not date it, but probably is, is older than 3,000 years old. Um, so the geomorphic investigations, along with Aiken's map, provides us with a compelling working hypothesis. The 1863 channel produced a toe cut terrace sequence about 700 meters north of the present channel. The movement of the river probably occurred during a single event during a more moist pluvial uh, cycle. Uh, more precise dating to the T1 is proposed using radiocarbon dating and also um, OSL dating as well. Um, so this, was, this is Joel's map, and he independently uh, mapped this, this meander scar up here um, during his field investigations. Uh, and then when we overlay his map, his, his geomorphic map with, with that of Aiken, we were pretty confident that this was the course of, um, of the Bear River in 1863 and the mouth of, of Battle Creek being about there. And this is where we've been, we actually focused a lot of our investigations um, <clears throat> during 2014 and 2015 in that area. Uh, but it's just, uh, I think it's really impressive to see such a dramatic landscape change in such a short period of time. Um, and we do have, between the 1872 GLO map and 1863, we have a pretty nice window of when that, when that uh, river movement event probably occurred, somewhere between 1863 and 1872, because the GLO map puts, puts the river down in its general, general area that we see today. So the historic documents and the geomorphic studies provided us with a compelling model of dramatic landscape change, but most importantly provides a more definitive location for the core area of the event and the location of the Shoshone Winter Village. This is a value not only for a, well, a more well-defined boundary for the historic landmark, but provides guidance to the northwest band of Shoshone on future purchase of, of land for the long-term protection, preservation, and, and interpretation of this sacred landscape. Um, and the Shoshone are, are, are in the process of raising money and have purchased some of the, some of the private lands out there, so they are working, working towards that goal. Um, additional work is proposed for 2017 that will include additional geomorphic investigations and geophysical surveys in the area of, of the confluence of Battle Creek and the Bear River. Um, and also additional uh, future goals that we have is um, our filmmaker Philip Shane uh, has been conducting interviews with historians, landowners, and members of the Northwest Bend Shoshone for the creation of a documentary. The documentary will focus on the archaeological efforts, but also the cultural and historic context of the massacre. Um, we are also seeking funding to begin collecting oral histories on the massacre and the, and the Shoshone history of, nor of, of northern Utah. Any questions? Yeah, so can, how is this going to live on in the future? I mean, can we access this online somewhere? You know, some interactive map or something that eventually will be produced? Well, I think that's the... Um, the ongoing discussion of what the Shoshone want to see. Uh, they, they recently submitted another um, grant proposal to the American Battlefield Protection Program that um, is going to address developing a preservation and interpretive um, uh, program for that, for that landscape. Um, hopefully it'll get funded this year and they'll be able to use that. And what that also allows them to do then is, is once they have a, a preservation plan in place, they can access or apply for federal funding through the uh, American Battlefield Protection uh, Program to, to purchase land so they can get matching funds. Um, so I think Darren Perry isn't here, I don't think he's, he thought he, he might be able to make it. But anyway, um, so their idea is to buy up all the land, at least in that core area where the village was and where, where most of the, um, the battle took place, uh, have, an, have an interpretive um, kiosk or of some kind, uh, or museum, um, for the future, and then you know some of the things that we've also talked about was was having something online um, that you know that, that could be accessed by people around the world to 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 look at maps, look at photographs, some of the oral histories. You know, we 
get some funding to do that. The oral histories would be online. So I think, you know, as time moves on, there's you know there's there's, there's great plans out there for for this. Um, there has been a lot of uh, press coverage of, of our work out there. That's that's been really exciting. We've we've gotten press coverage from as far away as Germany. Um, the Smithsonian Online did a did a paper, uh, an interview with us and Darren. There's, there's been local papers, articles in the paper. So it's 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 exciting to see that that this event is starting to see the light of day. Um, it's, you know, like Dr. Lewis said, you know, it, it's, it disappeared from our from our history. And uh, but I think you know some of the the attention is being brought back. So I don't know if that's answering your question, but that's you know kind of long term plans that. You know, takes funding. <laughs> yeah, um, I, there's a private civilian that's working uh, outside or is going on the private lands and doing archaeology. Is he coordinating at all with uh, people? Not that I'm aware of, no. Are you aware of this person? Um, no. Uh -oh, so. Okay, I just heard that yeah. rumor at Fort Douglas. So. Yeah, Kenny. What's the attitude of uh, folks in Franklin County been toward all of this? I think um, they've been they've been really supportive, as far as I can tell. The landowners have been allowed us access to their land. Um, I know that they've um, uh, that the Shoshone have, have been in consultation with purchasing the land. I think that's gone very well. Um, you know, originally when we went out there and started talking, Ken Reed. Did a lot of the initial contact with the landowners. They're a little skeptical about it. There is, you know, all the crazy stories about the government coming in and taking, confiscating land, and you know. Uh, but I think we we persuaded them otherwise that we were just there to try and tell the story. And and since then, you know, we've we've had nice relationships with them. So. With reaction on Main Street, family positive. I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've given talks in Franklin, and people have shown up and. Yeah, it's, there, there hasn't really been any any negativity that I can tell. Um, I think everybody, you know, with with over a century and a half of hindsight, I think they realize that you know this was was not a great event by anybody's standards. So, yes, yes. How large is the Shoshone Band now? And I thought the area was kind of known for the Bannock tribe, but it said in your presentation that no Bannocks were involved. That no Bannock uh, tribe. Um, I don't. You know, the the, the Bannock might have been there earlier because that Winter Village was also utilized by by Pocatello and the Fort Hall Shoshone. But he had left, I think, a week earlier or so, um, and there probably was another four or five hundred Shoshone there at that time. Um, so that Winter Village had been utilized by a lot of different Shoshone and and probably Bannock as well. Um, but the Northwest Band, as you've shown, claim that as their as their homeland, um, and I don't know what the size of the current, the, the current enrollment is. Um, it might say on their website that several hundred, a few thousand. You know, how the, how they count that, I'm not sure. Sorry, yes. follow up question. Okay, sure. So, your work in, in this area, uh, I see as kind of an emerging area in terms of preservation and, and how we talk about places in the U.S. Um, in, in that, you know, what you're looking at doing here is recognizing something that's part of our history but is sort of difficult to talk about. There are painful memories, um, and, and, and so this is an emerging area. And I'm wondering if you might have any um, thoughts about challenges in working with a site like this. Uh, because of some of those things inherent in what happened. So challenges or opportunities that may come from where you're really good at site. Yeah, I think it is It is very exciting in that respect. And, and Molly also um, worked over at Sand Creek on a, on a similar issue, is, is you have a landscape that, that has very different memories, very different um, histories to different lots of different people, whoever visits this area, and how, how you can convey that very complex history to a wide range of people, whether they're Europeans, whether they're locals, whether they're folks from Florida um, or Native Americans. I mean, that's that's a real challenge. Um, but it is an opportunity to try and bring the light that this this was a very complex part of our history. 
It wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty on either side. I mean, Native Americans had a lot. <clears throat> was a lot of atrocities on their side. So both, you know, nobody is, is blameless in a lot of ways in this in this history. Um, so I think you know the biggest opportunity that that it presents is to preserve this landscape and to talk openly about about what happened and, and why this happened and how we can maybe avoid it in the future. I mean, I, you know, there's still these these types of disputes going on between indigenous peoples and Europeans and um, it's, you know, it's not something that's gone away. Um, so it's, it, it's, you know, it'll, it'll be difficult, but I think it's, you know, it's a great opportunity to present this landscape and how, and how you, I think, you know, the, the real challenge is how can you present that landscape, interpret that landscape to a very broad audience so everybody can, can bring their, their background, their beliefs, their, or, and their histories to that and still have a strong feeling about that landscape and, and bring something away from that. I think, you know, and, you know, Sand Creek was a similar place like that. Is, you, know, you have a lot of different people that are visiting this landscape, but yet it's, it's very sacred to the Arapaho and the, and the Cheyenne because horrible things happen to their people there. Um, but they also want to share that landscape with people as well, too. And so, um, in your archaeology work, have you been able to get a better hold on the figure of how many people may have been massacred. I know 250 is the minimum, but I've seen um, some stuff saying as high as 500. Yeah, and, and in, a, in our report to the, the Park Service, um, Ken Reed went through and looked at all the different estimates, and um, and I think the 250 number seems to be the, the most agreeable one um, based on um, counts that were made. Um, some folks came up from Franklin, there were some counts made after the battle um, based on Connor's reports, Beach's report, you know, somewhere around 250, 275. Um, and we think the number of people that were probably there was somewhere around 500 based on a number of, of lodges that were counted. Um, so, you know, I think. 250 is probably is a, is a pretty solid number, somewhere there. Yeah. And you know, it's, we'll never we'll never know for sure. You know. But information keeps coming becoming available. There's there's names that have shown up on the rolls, so we, we actually have names of, of individuals that either were were there or were killed there that day. So in the in the LDS archives, so so that that helps out as well too. So yes. Kim, can you talk about the cultural artifacts you found or, or didn't find? Uh, and, and how, do, how do you dealt with those uh, landowners and tribes? Uh, yeah, most of the um, the artifacts that we found were probably related to either the railroad, um, which were interesting in and of themselves, or um, lots of agricultural things. We found lots of pins and barbed wire and tractor parts and things like that out there, spoons. Um, so the, the majority of... of, of uh, of artifacts that we found doing the metal detection were not in any way related to the to the to 1863. Um, and on the last day of our field work, though, we did find um, 44 caliper ball, um, and we think that that's the only thing that we can say could potentially have have been used by either the cavalry or or the Shoney. It, it fits with the ammunition of, of the guns that we knew. That, Cavalry um, were carrying, and potentially the Shoshone had, but that's but we really haven't haven't found anything. Um, <clears throat> the artifacts that most of the stuff that we found has has been discarded, or is still st actually sitting in a bucket at our at our office because we we probably had over fifteen hundred pieces of metal detection hits that we excavated, um, and um, and the majority of those, and, and the landowners haven't shown any interest in. Taking that stuff back, um, it's uh, it's been actually pretty amazing to see how much junk is out in far fields. Um, but yeah, so that's that's you know some part of the disappointing aspect of it is we haven't really found anything that we can definitively uh, date to that time period. There are a couple um, O rings that might that are part of bridles that may that may be part of the cavalry. We, we found some horseshoes, but those things are pretty non-diagnostic. Um, 
the geophysics is, is really interesting, um, and we're hoping to be able to go back and do some ground truthing on some of the geophysical images that we that we that we that Molly was detected. That might that might be the um, some of the lodges. That's so hard science. Nothing. I mean the. This landscape's been so fundamentally changed. Over well, we had we had that hearth, that 900-year-old hearth, and we also have a number of prehistoric lithic artifacts around the landscape. So we know people have been living there at least a thousand years, and probably longer if we we spend time, more time looking for the archaeology. But but there is it is a landscape that people have been using for a long time. So, yeah. So. Well, thank you.